Hi, my name is Ivo and I'm doing research into Nikola Tesla's radiant electricity. I made a new solid state radiant circuit that I now will present to you. It is based on what I've learned from the older radiant power circuit that I published in April of 2019. This new radiant circuit is based on a MOSFET half bridge and therefore I call it the radiant half bridge circuit. This new radiant circuit can be used for a Tesla coil, real like Nikola Tesla intended it to be, with an impulsed primary. But there are many more possibilities. Enjoy! In the description of this video I have posted several links to my website maxstar.eu. Here you can also find the schematics. First a small recap of the April 2019 power circuit so you know what I'm talking about. The L1 coil produces negative voltage impulses that are fed into the series resonant L2 coil. L2 acts as the primary and L3 is the secondary. This impulsed series resonant coil is able to produce power in a parallel resonant coil L3, which is loose coupled to L2. This is rather exceptional, as resonant coils normally do not produce any real power. One of the things I didn't like with that old circuit is that it had only one impulse per two voltage maximums. So only one impulse per sine wave period, which has two maximums. The other maximum had no impulse and no power. Thus, my mission was to develop a circuit that would have alternating impulses. One impulse for each voltage maximum. There's two impulses per period. And that is what I have now accomplished in my new circuit. Both voltage maximums have an impulse. I also experimented a lot with the DC offset and came to the conclusion that it is not needed. This makes the circuit much simpler and also safer as there are no caps charged with DC after the circuit has been turned off. This new radiant circuit is based on a half bridge. You can find a lot of information on half bridge circuits and how they work, so I will keep it simple. A half bridge circuit is a half of a H bridge circuit, and a half bridge circuit is able to provide alternating voltages to a grounded coil. Here you see the schematics, so you get a good visualization of what I'm talking about. My L1 coil produces both polarity impulses. This can be done very easily by grounding it on the outside rim while providing the inside rim with alternating voltages. Therefore I now use two NMOSFET switches that are alternately opening and closing. One is turned on, then it is both turned off for the 1%, the other is turned on and it is turned off for 1%, the other turns on again for the next cycle. In the middle, in the series connection between the MOSFETs, are the two coils connected. L1 connected to ground, which is equal here to the zero volts, and L2, which is series resonant, also connected to ground. So these MOSFETs alternately provide positive and negative DC voltages to the grounded L1 and L2 coils. Each time when a MOSFET switches off, the other MOSFET stays also off for a very short time, which is called the dead time. 
In this dead time, it gives L1 the ability to produce impulses. These impulses from L1 are the result from L1 becoming resonant during the dead time. Hereby the magnetic field energy of L1 is transformed into a dielectric field voltage. L2 is again series resonant and grounded on one side, the outside rim. The inside rim of L2 is connected by the series tuning capacitor, which is made from multiple parallel capacitors. By being series resonant, L2 provides a low impedance path to ground for the impulses created by L1. In other words, for the impulse, L2 looks like a low resistance wire to ground. What now happens when switching this is we start off with only one MOSFET turned on. With this one MOSFET turned on, L1 will charge up with a magnetic field. L2 will be provided with the energy to become series resonant. Then when the magnetic field is charged up and the L2 is resonant, we switch off that MOSFET. Now we do not have any voltage supplied anymore, but we still have that series connection between L1 and L2. L1 is then discharging its magnetic energy via a, an impulse into L2. And L2 is series resonant and this makes its impedance very low. So L1 will see L2 with its uh, capacitors as a wire resistance to ground, very low impedance. So L1 discharges its magnetic field energy into ground via the series resonant L2, which has low impedance. In this way, we now have a primary coil L2 that is impulsed series resonant. We will need a symmetric power supply because the ground of the L1 and L2 coils needs to be in the middle between the positive and the negative voltage supplies. This way the alternating impulses are generated by L1 and the L2 is made series resonant. The circuit starts off with a symmetric power supply. We have a positive and a negative voltage relative to earth ground which is in the middle. These capacitors will be placed close to the circuits to provide the DC voltages. So we can have an external power supply that is symmetric and these capacitors will provide the fast currents that are needed to switch at high frequencies. From here we enter the MOSFETs. MOSFET 1, MOSFET 2 placed in series. I use two silicon carbide and MOSFETs as switches. I added two diodes here in series with the MOSFETs. This is to prevent the impulses from leaking away from the circuit via the body diodes of the MOSFETs. My setup thus can handle 1000 volt positive and negative impulses. These added diodes need to be able to close very fast and block the impulses. This way L2 will be the only path to ground for the impulses and that is what we want. Each MOSFET has an own body diode and this bo body diode provides a path to ground via the power supply for the impulses of L1. So L1 could discharge its energy via the body diodes. These impulses that L1 generates are blocked by these series diodes. So if a positive impulse would enter the body diode here, it is blocked by this diode. And if a negative impulse is Entering the body diode here, it is blocked by this diode. As you can see, 
they are in opposite polarity. That's why they block. Each MOSFET has its own 49% duty square wave. So I use two separate square wave signals and two separate gate drivers. Previously, I used the high side switching module HSM to drive the gate of the MOSFET. But now I needed to change this circuit into two isolated gate drive modules so I could drive them with an external signal generator. By now I'm further developing this gate drive circuit into a single PCB without the need for any batteries or pulse transformers. Now we have two MOSFETs so we need two gate driver circuits and these gate driver circuits need two signals and these signals are out of phase so when one is high the other one is low. And for a very short time, the other one stays low and then it is turned on and turned off again. And the other is again very shortly turned off and turns on again. To drive the gate of the MOSFET, I use a gate driver IC that is isolated. Therefore, it has two power supplies needed. They are isolated from each other. And the other side, the 5 volts, are just from an external power supply as that doesn't need to be isolated. The chip I use is the 1EDI60I12AF and it is isolated to around 1200 volts. And that is what this red line represents because the input side where the signal of the TTL, the transistor, transistor logic signal from the square wave generator enters is isolated from the signal that goes into the gate. And this is a very clever chip. It works very good. It can provide very high currents to switch the uh, MOSFET on and off very fast. And it has separate uh, outputs for the gate resistor. One is to charge up that is the six so that resistor charges up the gate and the seven uh, is the resistor that discharges the gate back to zero so 20 volts charges up from this resistor and then it's discharged through the other resistor to the zero volts now we will take a look at the working circuit. First, I'll show you the setup. Here is the half bridge circuit. It is fed by two square wave signals for my square wave signal generator. The positive voltage is coming in here, the negative voltage coming in here. That is from the DC power supply, it's from here. Then I have the capacitors here that feed the fast currents into the uh, half bridge and from here I have also the ground connection the circuit is fed from a 12 volt power supply then from here in the center I have the connections to the coils so one is going to the L1 and the other is going to the L2 but first it goes to the L2 tuning capacitor and that is this switchboard here you see the other one, this is uh, for tuning the L3 coil, which is parallel resonant. And this is series resonant for the L2 coil. I've got here a probe, uh, color coded the yellow. This is a high voltage probe. And I've got another probe here. This is my current probe, the Pintec PA655. This way I can uh, measure the voltage and the current of the series resonant L2. Then this is the L2 coil. As you can see, it sits on top of a block. This block is nylon, 25 millimeters thick. I use it as a distance uh, holder. Uh, at the same time, it's a good dielectric. Underneath you see the L1 and L3 coil. I will vary this setup. Then the L3 coil, as said, is parallel tuned by this tuning board. It's the same as that one. Uh, from here on, the L3 is again 
grounded on the outside rim and the inside rim is parallel resonant so from there on I go into this uh, piece of work <laughs> this is a rectifier it's a half bridge rectifier because I only use uh, one wire uh, power transmission because the other side is grounded then I go into a positive capacitor and a negative capacitor so this turns it into positive DC and negative DC via the diodes which again are ultra fast and in between th uh, the capacitors is again a uh, earth ground so we got series capacitor with earth, earth ground in the center just like the power supply and then we have a lamp that's loaded on the capacitors I've got a DC milliamp current meter in the line of the lamp so I can see how much current I'm drawing with the lamp at, at the same time I have a DC meter so I can measure the DC voltage of the lamp I've got another high voltage probe over here can't really see that it is connected to the L3 uh, coil on the resonant side color coded orange that's basically it if we now tune the circuit by changing the square wave frequency we will notice that we can dial in the resonance frequency without any impulse visible we now look at the resonant sine waves of L2 in yellow we have the voltage and in green we have the current in purple here we see the half bridge circuit that supplies the positive voltage and the negative voltage and as can be seen when the positive voltage ends we have a positive voltage maximum on the L2 series resonance coil right now I've tuned it to 58.85 kilocycles per second which is the resonant frequency of this setup there is no impulse seen right now that is because the impulse from L1 the magnetic field energy of L1 is injected into L2 and it is absorbed into the capacitor of the series resonance system the full energy is is completely integrated into the series resonant L2 coil capacitor system what I would expect now is that 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 this is the maximum value for the fields we have around 790 volt peak to peak and we have 7.2 amps peak to peak for the current and the current is a uh, representative of the magnetic field and the voltage is a representative of the dielectric field if you now tune a bit higher than the resonant frequency of L2 the impulses will appear again on top of the sine wave maximum of the voltage of L2 when tuned correctly the L2 voltage sine wave grows even more with the added impulse and I will do that right now I will tune higher you can see now the impulses arrive again at the same time you can see the voltage uh, sign and the current sign also are amplified which is pretty odd we have 8.5 amps 8.9 9.5 9.8 9.9 10 amps peak to peak 10.2 10.3 10.5 10.6 there is a maximum to be reached 10.7 10.8 I'm going higher and higher no that's the maximum 10.9 is around the maximum that can be produced I will reduce the amplitude of L2 so we can see it a little bit better so uh, we now have a rather big impulse this impulse is at its maximum uh, limit uh, which is around 900 volts right now we now have the L1 impulses 
which carry the magnetic field energy of L1 into L2. And these impulses are not charging up the capacitor anymore, although they will be a little bit. But I would expect if the impulse is riding on top that the energy is wasted and we would not have this large amplitude. This amplified amplitude of L2 is rather strange because we, we don't have all the energy of the impulse that is absorbed in L2 uh, anymore, but still it grows in voltage. So there is an amplification. We have a much larger current going through the system of 10.9 amps peak to peak. I will turn off uh, the current right now so we can see the sine wave of the voltage of L2. So we get a positive impulse and a negative impulse. A positive impulse on the positive voltage maximum of the sine wave and a negative impulse on the negative voltage maximum. Now we can see the, the amperage is amplified. The top of the sine wave of the current still looks like a s normal sine wave. And the bottom part also looks like a normal sine wave. But in the middle, from the zero point where the impulse is happening, the steepness is much steeper of the current sine wave. And this is due to the amplification of the impulse of the current. The current is amplified by the impulse. This is very special because now the impulse is not charging up the capacitor anymore, but it is charging up the magnetic field of the coil. The impulse at the zero point of the current sign is amplifying the startup of the current. It starts up much faster and that way it is amplified because before we had 8.9 amps and now we have 10.8 amps which is much more than we had before. I will now turn on the voltage again and show you what happens when I tune up and down so you can see the amplification taking place. I'm now at 64.35 kilohertz and I will go to the resonance frequency again you can see the amplitude is going back to what it was before and we get a perfect sine wave again. Now the sine waves are as we expect them to be, perfect sine waves. The impulse isn't visible but if I tune higher again because now I'm at 58.95 kilo cycles per second I'll dial up and again you can see the amplitude of the current is rising. It is getting much and much bigger until we reach the maximum. If I tune higher than that maximum, the amplitude will become less again and the impulse will become larger. So that isn't really efficient. So I'll tune it to the perfect point of 10.9 around 10.9 somewhere here now what I will do is show you the impulse duration I will tune into the impulse I'll turn off the current again and I'll tune into the impulse now we have the impulse visualized and I have a cursor set here this is cursor 1, this is cursor 2, and here you see the values of cursor 1 and cursor 2. And the delta T of the cursors is 428.8 nanoseconds. Now that is very little. Usually I get uh, much longer duration impulses from 1 microsecond to around 800 nanoseconds. But this time it is much quicker. Okay, so far so good. This concludes this test, which shows the current amplification by the impulse. After growing my beard a little bit longer, I understood.
why this amplification happens, which does not happen at the exact resonant frequency where the impulse is fully absorbed by the capacitor. Let me explain why the L2 current is amplified by the L1 impulse. First, we need to take a look at what the L1 impulse is. The L1 impulse is a voltage half wave. This is created by the magnetic energy that has been built up in L1 that starts resonating during the 1% dead time of the radiant half bridge circuit. During the 1% dead time, the built up magnetic field energy around L1 is transformed into a resonant voltage sign. If series resonant L2 wasn't there, L1 would keep ringing at its resonant frequency, whereby the voltage would transform into a current and vice versa, back and forth like a pendulum. But now the L2 coil is present and L2 is series resonant and presents a low impedance path to ground for the energy of L1 to discharge through. A half wave means it starts in the first quarter from zero volt and then becomes maximum voltage, positive or negative, after which it then becomes zero volt again in the second quarter. In the second quarter, where the voltage is maximum and becomes zero again, the voltage is transformed into a current that builds up. But this time it is not the L1 current, but the L2 current. At the start of the second quarter, the voltage is maximum and the current starts building up from zero to maximum. When the current is maximum, the voltage is zero again. And this concludes the discharge of L1 through L2. This current is now the L2 current. This resonant transformation from voltage to current happens at the resonant frequency of L2. And I mean L2 by itself without the series tuning capacitor. And this L2 resonant frequency is much higher than the series resonant L2 frequency. And this explains why the current can rise so much faster as it is a transformation at a higher frequency. The much slower L2 series resonance with the capacitor has zero current at the moment of the impulse. It just is slowly charging up the magnetic field of L2 and starts building up the current, but much slower. Let me sum it up together. The L1's magnetic field current transforms into a dielectric field voltage which then again transforms into a magnetic field current, but this time it is the magnetic field current of the series resonant L2 coil, which is just slowly starting up. And this transformation from voltage to current happens really quick at the resonant frequency of L2 by itself which is much faster than the relatively slower L2 capacitor series resonant frequency. Now why results this in a higher amplitude series resonant wave? This is due to a difference in impedance. The capacitor is already charged to the maximum voltage and has a higher impedance. This builds up less voltage by the impulse. When the impulse is transformed into a current in L2, the impedance of L2 is still low as it has zero current at that point in time. And this makes it able to make a very quick change in current by the low impedance. Furthermore, this build up of current by the impulse transformation is assisted by the discharge of the series tuning capacitor. And that does not happen when the impulse only charges up the capacitor. The built up current from the impulse now is further assisted to build up 
by the discharge of the series tuning capacitor. The currents are now compounded and this does not happen if the impulse charges the capacitor as then the voltage is already at its maximum and it will only start to drop to zero again. All this is shown in the previous experiment where I used the voltage impulse, the inductor spike, from the L1 coil discharge which happens when the switch is opened. The same could be done with a current impulse created by a capacitor discharge, also resonant. This current impulse would then be used to charge a series tuning capacitor at the point where the capacitor would be zero voltage and the coil then would start the charge up of the capacitor. But this would be a lot harder as a capacitor needs a closed switch to discharge through. And Tesla used the spark gap for this, but solid state doesn't know a spark gap, but it does know how to open up a switch really fast and that's why I use the coil. For the next experiment I will add a parallel capacitor to L3. This will tune L3 down to resonate at L2's resonant frequency. Both L2 and L3 will now have the same frequency but now we will have two resonant frequencies. For the next experiment I have changed the setup a little bit. I removed the load from L3 and I changed the coils. Now the top coil is the L3 coil which is distanced from the L2 coil which is close coupled to the L1 coil. So L1 and L2 are close coupled. I use the 25 millimeter nylon block again for distancing to L3. This gives a anomaly which I will show now. Uh, another thing I changed is the fan setup. I blew up one MOSFET because it wasn't cooled uh, enough so instead of having them series connected I now parallel connected the fans so they blow harder. I'm giving it uh, 24 volts and now the amps are really low. I only have 0 0.09 amps by the dual power supply that are symmetrical. Here you can see the scope shot. Now there is something strange going on. If you now look at the yellow voltage sign of L2, it is out of phase. If I turn off the current, you can also see it is discharging now. This is because the impulse is now negative on the positive maximum and positive on the negative maximum. You can't see this impulse right now, I'll show it a little bit later. So L2 is being discharged because it is out of phase. And that is a anomaly I can't explain. This only happens when L1 and L2 are close coupled. Normally the voltage sine wave will be 180 degrees out of phase giving a positive maximum when the positive impulse is created. Let me tune it up so you can see the impulse appear and there is the impulse. As you can see it is now the wrong polarity but it is not due to the impulses, it is due to the voltage sign being out of phase. And this is very strange. The only solution for this is to distance L1 and L2. So I will change the setup again so it will work as expected. I will turn on the current again because there still is happening something strange which I now cannot explain with the previous explanation and that's, that's why this anomaly is so very interesting. 
it is still amplified when the impulse is there. That should not happen. So I'm tuning down and you can see it is lower when fully resonant. When I tune up the impulse is there and everything is amplified again. I have no explanation for this. It is really something to think about. Another uh, fun fact is of course we now have very high voltages with only very little power input because we have 0.09 amps on the power supply with 2 times 12 volts so 24 volts at 0.09 amps which is very very low. The lowest resonant frequency is the transverse electromagnetic resonance, or in short TEM resonance. With this resonance L2 and L3 are in phase. I have now changed the setup again. The L1 and L2 are now loose coupled. They are distanced by 25 millimeters. I used some electrical tape rolls for that. The L2 and L3 still is the same distance by the white nylon block of 25 mm. So L1, L2 and L3 form one stack of pancake coils and each coil is distanced by 25 mm. I have now dialed in the transverse electromagnetic resonance mode which is the lowest resonant frequency. It is 56 0.53 kilocycles per second. I haven't changed the capacity of the L2 and L3, they are the same as before. As can be seen, the L3 voltage in orange and the L2 voltage in yellow are in phase. Furthermore, can be seen that the L2 voltage now also again by distancing the L1 and L2 coil is in phase with the impulses again. I will dial in the impulses now so you can see them. Here they are and as you can also see the amplitude is rising again when I inject the impulse. So the distancing of L1 and L2 loose coupling them has fixed the anomaly. Now I will tune to the higher resonant frequency. This is the longitudinal magnetodielectric resonance, or in short, LMD resonance. With LMD resonance, the L2 and L3 voltage sine waves are out of phase. And here is the resonant frequency again. As you can now see, I'll turn up the power a little bit more. Now the L3 voltage is out of phase. I will center it over the L2 coil. And this is very interesting. Because in this longitudinal magnetodielectric mode, the voltage of L2 in yellow and the voltage of L3 in orange are out of phase, which means there is a voltage difference between L2 and L3 being built up each time and it becomes zero each time. So there is a pumping action in the dielectric field between L2 and L3 and that is where the nylon plate is. That's why I have it there because uh, I find this very interesting. I will now turn off the L3 signal, turn on the current again. We have now 11.5 amps peak to peak and I will dial up a frequency again. We have 11.5 11 11 amps and I'm tuning up and again you can see the amplification 11.9 12 12.06 12.08 12 12.1 that's about it i think 12.1 amperes per peak to peak 
my impulses are a little bit bigger now around uh, 700 volts I will now turn on L3 again as you can see uh, the L3 voltage now is much larger than the L2 voltage it is amplified as you can see with LMD resonance the L3 coil is much higher in voltage and this is odd as we haven't changed the capacity inductance and resistance of L2 or L3 I'm at 89.03 kilocycles per second. The power now is uh, 1.76 amps with 2 times 8.8 .8 volts DC. One more thing to note is with the longitudinal mode, the L3 coil is becoming warm. And with the transverse mode, the L2 coil is becoming warm. And this is just like Eric Dorla explained in his Borderlands video in the from I believe 1988. And this concludes the test of the longitudinal and the transverse resonant modes. As I have shown we can recycle the magnetic field energy of the L1 pulsed coil to amplify the series resonant current of the L2 coil. Series resonant L2 can be brought into two kinds of resonance with parallel resonant L3. Hereby L2 is the primary and L3 acts as the secondary coil. The lowest resonant frequency resonance is TEM and has L2 and L3 voltages in phase. The higher frequency resonance is LMD. Hereby the L2 and L3 voltages are out of phase. When L1 and L2 are closed coupled, an anomaly puts the L2 sine waves 180 degrees out of phase relative to the impulses. This only happens with the transverse electromagnetic resonance. With LMD resonance the L2 is not phase shifted relative to the impulses. By loose coupling L1 and L2, we can get the right phase of L2 relative to the impulses again. The impulses can even be tuned to the current maximum of L2 by using a smaller distance between L1 and L2. In theory, this circuit has the possibility of generating magnetic and dielectric induction in L3 at the same time using two primary coils, one on each side of L3 that acts as the secondary. The pulsed L1 coil provides the magnetic induction while the series resonant impulsed L2 coil provides the amplified dielectric induction. L1 is the tight coupled magnetic induction primary and L2 is the loose coupled dielectric induction primary. But that is still theory. And theory is nothing without a working proof. So I'll keep researching it. When I almost finished editing this video I realized I didn't show you the burning of the lamp. The 28 watt halogen. So let's do this. I will use the setup of the dual primary theory with L3 that powers the lamp in the middle of L1 and L2 whereby pulsed L1 is close coupled to L3 and the impulsed series resonant L2 is loose coupled to L3. All of the coils are wound in the same direction. None of them are flipped over. The rest is all the same. I didn't change the capacitance. What I did now is tune to the transverse electromagnetic resonance first at 58.23 kilohertz. Uh, we now have 83.4 volts at what is this 75 milliamps and the input power is 0.37 amps at 2 times 12 volts DC. I will now tune in the resonance again with the impulse. I now will also correct the face of the purple square wave as it was displayed wrong before. So now the positive voltage correlates with the negative impulse as it should be. So again L3 
in orange, the voltage, and L2 in yellow and green for the voltage and the current. I will dial in to the maximum current. It's now 4.8 amps peak to peak. If I go higher, it doesn't amplify anymore. No, it becomes less, 3.3 amps. And even less and less and less and less. So that doesn't work really good. So I've got that impulse right now. It's 61.5 volts. I'll go down to the resonant frequency again. You can see it rising up. The lamp will get a little bit brighter. And now I'm resonant again at 83 volts DC and 75 milliamps. So the transverse mode isn't really effective. The tricky bit is now to tune L3 so it becomes LMD resonant again. But this is hard to see as the lamp loads down the L3 sine wave. I'm at 58.23 kHz and I'm going to move up in frequency. So transverse mode still still transverse mode whereby the L2 and L3 voltages are in phase. Yeah, that should be the resonant point right there. This is 77.23 kilohertz. It's 46.47 volts DC and we only have around 57 milliamps. I'll go up in voltage now so we can better see what I'm doing. I'm now at two times 30 volts at 0 0.22 amps. The lamp is now pretty bright, although I have more input of course, 60 volts. And the DC voltage is now 126.1 volts at 93 milliamps. The lamp is now powered by L3 and L3 is powered by the magnetic induction of the pulsed L1 coil and also powered by the dielectric induction of the L2 coil. At least that is the theory. But maybe for this to work, the L2 coil needs to be flipped over. Here's the probe shot. And I'll resize the L2. Now the L2 looks pretty weird. It's a bit chopped up. And the current also. It doesn't look like a sine wave anymore. Although the L2 coil is on top and uh, loose coupled to L3. Now it shows a very different waveform. This setup needs to be further fine tuned and investigated, but that is all for the future. This circuit gives us plenty of possibilities to further research the radiant energy effects. I have made the Radiant Half Bridge Circuit, PCB and the part list available in the link below in the video description. This way anyone that is interested can duplicate the circuit and experiment with it. Donations are always much appreciated because this work is all open source, meaning that I will share all the information that I gain with the community that is interested. You can fund this open source research by giving a donation on my PayPal account that is listed below in the description of the video. If you have questions, you can do so in the comment section below. Please subscribe, like and share this video and turn on notifications if you want to get a personal call when my next video is out. Thank you for watching and good luck on your rebuild of this circuit and its rather unique effects. See you next time.